Our next testimony is from Ed Bauer, and Ed has called Intercessor his home for many years. He's a retired police detective. He and Geraldine had a heart for the men's uh, ministry at the Bridge House and serving there faithfully, however uh, the Lord could use them. Um, he's an upstanding, compassionate Stevens minister, and he's really an inspiration to all who get to know him. Would you welcome Ed Bauer? pray you just bless my brother, Lord. Um, let that word of his testimony, that truth of who you are and all that you've done, Lord, let that come forth and bless those who hear it. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I have to thank uh, Bishop for giving me a promotion. I was never a detective. <laughs> <laughs> I could have used the extra money. <laughs> who knew? Yeah. And uh, start off with, I'm one of six children, uh, five children. I was number three. And my mother raised us all by herself, basically. And uh, the one thing that she always did that I can remember, going back as far as I can remember, she made sure we went to church every Sunday. And we grew up in the Episcopal Church. And uh, it was good. And I always liked going to church. I served as an acolyte in the crucifer, and I felt very good there, almost like home, but didn't hear the gospel message too much, really. So that was something that was going to come down later on. So uh, as I got to be a little older teen, there was a big upheaval there, and uh, the church was breaking up a bit, and we left. And uh, so then, I went in the Navy, and then I came out, and uh, you ever, when you were, maybe some of the older people remember, in school, you used to have to take this test, and this test was determined what you should gravitate toward as a profession. So mine came out a clergyman or a social worker. <laughs> so I became a cop. Who knew? But again, uh, to make a long story short, we wound up finally in a Christian church. I had trouble uh, going to church because of my schedule. We used to change our tours every week. And I was in what they call the relief squad. So if I was working the 4 to 12 on a Saturday, I had to be back at work on Sunday for a day tour for church crossings. So, I make one, one Sunday out of uh, three. So uh, anyway, we finally wound up in this Christian church. And uh, my wife had, uh, we were, this church we were in before, my wife met a couple of women there. And they belonged to what they would call a Christian's women's club that used to meet in Mineola. And they invited her to go along. And she did. And that's where she started really finding the Lord. And... Uh, so when we wound up going to this new church now, she committed her life. That was back in uh, 73, 74. And uh, I didn't. She did. And she got baptized again. And uh, she, became, she was a church secretary there for a long time. So suddenly, when she became a church secretary, I had a new part-time job working with men there, doing all different things around the church, fixing this, fixing that. <laughs> taking the wall down, putting the same wall up. <laughs> and you look back on it, and I look back on those things, and even uh, my childhood going in the Episcopal Church, I was being, uh, God was actually doing something in my life I didn't know. But uh, as far as the spiritual gift goes, the one gift was the spirit of service. And uh, 
So anyway, we were going to this church and I guess we were around 1979, 1980. God finally said, it's time for you to seal the deal. <laughs> and so I accepted him. No bang, no bells. Life was just the same. I, I, I had a good life going on. I wasn't in crisis or anything. But the difference was I was listening more closely to messages, and we were reading scripture. And uh, it's, it became more apparent, too, that uh, he was leading me in a, another direction also, which was a uh, life of mercy. And what you find with, with God, what I found anyway, he does some of his best works when there's bad things happening. And uh, the one time there, it was 2005, we had Hurricane Katrina. And my son's church went on a mission trip down there to help out. And they went to New Orleans at the time. And that didn't really work out too well for them because there was too much crime. And they couldn't really work because people were being held up, materials were being stolen. And so the following year, they're going to Mississippi. So I was able to go down with them uh, every summer. They would go for a week. You pay your own way. And we did, made four trips down there. We were supposed to make a fifth one, but then the uh, pastor had a heart attack and the trip got canceled. But I remember when I came back from the first trip and my wife was gonna be all excited to hear how great it was and I came back like a madman. I was so angry. And my anger was because of the way the government were treating the people there and contractors treating the people there. So later on I started realizing I, mi I missed it. I missed the whole thing. I missed that God was working down there. And all these churches that were going down, they were all God's people. And we heard it so many times from the people down there that uh, if it wasn't for the churches, we don't know what we would have done. Because their houses were in bad shape, some destroyed. So it was, you went back again, and it was just very interesting Churches were coming from all over the place. The first house we worked on, we were supposed to put a roof on it. And the, the group that had been before, they got their other job done soon, and they had the roof done. So we were basically, thank goodness, doing a lot of work on inside, because down there in the morning, like at 715, it's 85 degrees and about 90% humidity. And uh, it, it was just a really grateful experience. It really was. And then uh, when we came to this church, we came in 2010 to Intercessor. And so we were here for maybe like a month or so. And we said, well, we're trying to think of something maybe we could do within the church. And when you have these signs up here with all the hymns and all on it, they used to be in the announcements before the service started. They had all these announcements. So we look up and we see a sign that says, Come dine with us at the bridge house. Make a meal and come. So they said, really, you had to uh, give Father Brett a note, and he'll get back to you. Well, our note wound up on the bottom of a pile. And anyway, there was nothing happened in a week or two. So we spoke to somebody, and they said, well, go see Charlie McCarthy. So we said, well, who's Charlie McCarthy? So it's him there. So we spoke to him. And then uh, Father Brett called us and he says he was sorry that the stuff got lost and all. But they were thinking about this announcement that had been up on the screen. And so Susan and him looked. They couldn't find it. We saw it. They... <laughs> <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> but, uh, and uh, so we started making meals and we'd stay and sit with the men and talk. And the only thing I said to Charlie was I did not want these men to know what I did because a lot of them came from the county and we may have actually drug raided their houses at the time. So uh, 
We did that, and then in 2012, uh, I got diagnosed with uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And uh, so I was going to be going through regimens of chemotherapy and these other infusions of this drug Rituxan. And before I started my treatments, uh, Bishop Bates gave a sermon, and I, I can't remember the title of it or what, but the emphasis on it was, but God. And uh, the thing was, he said, God is asking you to challenge him. He takes care of the lilies in the field, takes care of the birds. He wants to take care of you. Challenge me, trust me, and see you can trust me. So he said, you should take your thing that's big at the time and give it over to God. Give it over and let him take care of it. And don't worry about it. Because normally you would just pray for the grace to get through these things. He says, but the trick to this is don't take it back. So I got my deal here. Every three weeks you're going to go for chemotherapy. And in between you'd be coming in for tests. So I had the first treatment and all. And when I did, when I prayed like that, it felt like the world came off my shoulders. And uh, so I had the first treatment. And then three weeks later, I'm back for the second one. And what I didn't realize, I take your blood every time you go. And they said, well, you can't have a treatment today. I said, why not? Your platelets are too low. So right away, I took it back because I could feel this crushing. I had it all figured out, <laughs> starting date, finish date. So then I realized what I had done, and I gave it back to him again, and I never took it back. And it made, made for a very easy time, really. My wife always said, you know, if, if nobody knew, they wouldn't know you're sick. And uh, at the time, too, I was very involved with Samaritan's Purse with their Operation Christmas trial. And uh, I used to work at the collection site and where we'd load the trailers up. And that was my job, loading the trailer. So I was able to get through that and do that because uh, that was always the week before Thanksgiving. And I started my treatments in October. So I made it through that. And uh, it, what it did then after that, it opened up myself because I never would, I would never go up to anybody who was sick like that and say anything to them. And it was like, God sent me on a job. And there was a few men in the church at the time. So I was in contact with them a lot. And uh, the funny part is a lot of people, I think, are more scared of the treatments than they are of the disease. And one of the, they had people, uh, we were sitting in church on a Sunday, and they said, turn around to the person behind you and uh, tell them what you're afraid of. And so it turns out there's a couple here. This fellow had, he's got heart issues and all, and he got diagnosed with cancer, and he was terrified of the treatments. And so my wife says, well, he's getting the treatments. And he couldn't believe it. So he wound up in the hospital. I visited, visited him in the hospital and all. And uh, so that, that was good. And uh, there was a couple of others I would speak to all the time. And one time I was even visiting somebody in the hospital and th th there was a fellow in a bed next to him who had just gotten some bad news. And we were able to talk with him. So God uses you in some of the worst times. Amen. So, he does. <laughs> and then uh, uh, after my wife passed, uh, how... She had a uh, Stephen minister calling her. All of a sudden, she starts getting these calls from Janice Tully. She's getting, who is this woman? <laughs> you know, what, what are they talking about? We, I didn't even know what Stephen's ministry was at the time. So after she passed and all, and uh, got to know Mary person there, I call her the godmother. <laughs> if, you, if, if you remember the uh, movie, when his daughter was getting married, he, the godfather sitting in there, and all these people coming in to see the godfather, and he was going to take care of things. This is Mary on Sunday. 
They are lined up. Great person. I never would have met her if my, if my wife hadn't died. So out of that, uh, she asked me to be a Stevens minister, which I did. So what the, the cross, what it means to me is hope, love, and life. And the other thing it means to me, you're on the road for an adventure. <laughs> really, it's like that slogan they used to have in the Navy there, it's more than a job, it's an adventure. And walking with the Lord is just that. And uh, we're always a work in progress from the beginning, and we'll be a work in the progress until we take our last breath here. Amen. Uh, Thank you.